you know, unfortunately, my colleague uh, Fisher Black passed away in 1995, two years before he would have uh, joined in uh, receiving the uh, Nobel Prize in 1997 with Robert Merton and myself, that's for sure. Uh, it's 50 years since the publication of the uh, uh, Journal of Political Economy article in May of 1973, but really 53 years uh, since we started working on option theory and valuation of options. Uh, the idea of hedging really uh, took us to the idea of getting rid of economic risk and uh, led to dynamics. But at the same time, it took a long time for us to figure out how to integrate and have a valuation formula where simply we uh, use the idea of um, thinking about myriad state variables, changes in interest rates, changes in volatility and the like. And finally, after a couple of years of fruitility and trying to figure out what to do, basically we decided on to have a model which assumed the volatility was constant and the interest rate was constant and it was a European type option. A lot of you have done theory over time and its applications which relaxed a lot of these assumptions. But we ended up with two things. One is a technology or a way of thinking about how to value any option depending on the dimensions you want to put into the problem. But two is that and a model, and the Black-Scholes model is obviously an incomplete description of reality, but the question is how far it uh, gets us going in this direction in understanding options and option pricing. I think it has, has withstood a lot of time and a lot of different criticisms and additions to really say it's quite robust, and I'll explain a little bit more of that uh, in a moment or two when I share my screen. Uh, Fisher and I were hunters and we had our ideas and we tried to husband these ideas until we figured out exactly how far we could go in understanding the valuation process. And then we decided at a conference that was held at MIT with many academics coming in from around the country uh, to present our paper the uh, first Black-Scholes option pricing paper, I guess, in 1971. And uh, Bob Merton was supposed to attend the ceremony session, but he uh, overslept and he didn't attend the session uh, and came to my office a few days later and said, I heard you gave a paper on option pricing. And we then had a long discussion after that about what our technology was and how we addressed the option pricing uh, problem. And we had done it using uh, uh, sort of more discrete time. And as we approach continuous time, using the idea of uh, the capital asset pricing model at the time. And Bob thought about a lot of what we had done and, decide, and then figured out through prodding on my part that maybe as you let time get shorter and shorter, that you ended up with a perfect correlation situation. So that's what we um ended up getting to with Bob and uh, he added tremendously, but it's great when you have colleagues who can add a lot of value to your thinking at the same time, criticize you constructively and then add a lot to the uh, problem ahead. But basically after we talked about our research in our paper and Bob wrote up his paper and his ideas that from that time forward, there was myriad papers that were published on option pricing. So we couldn't keep the source of what we had secret and it evolved over time uh, to add a lot of um, uh, value for others who had done research and continue to add a lot of value for this, our activities. Yeah, basically the, um, you know, if we look at um, just some pictures of what were there in 1973, at the bottom of the screen, there's a picture of myself. That's what I look like next to Merton Miller, who is my teacher. And uh, some people say I don't have changed very much over the years, but I think I have. And on um, the picture above is a picture of, uh, of Fisher Black and myself. And that was taken probably in 1982 or 83. So about 10 years after the publication of the Black-Scholes option pricing model. 
Uh, basically, the interesting thing is that a lot of my time when Fisher and I uh, were involved in research was a really dynamic time in finance because we had the real foundations of a micro-positive economic approach. And basically, the micro-positive economic approach is really think about a theory that instruction informs, but then it helps individuals and entities, firms make better decisions to, uh, to greater effect. And so that basically with the idea of Markowitz's portfolio theory, in fact, Milton Friedman said that wasn't economics, but actually Markowitz's theory that what was important in diversification and portfolio construction was what risks are important. And that's covariance risk that Sharp amplified. Fama came with the idea of market prices being very important. And then Miller talked about corporate finance. And these four contributions really set the stage for Fisher and I to take tenants and of what they had uh, shown in their research and be able to develop the option pricing technology. First of all, we talked a lot about in finance, uh, having reserves and then investing in equities. Two is the idea of thinking about uh, diversification, but no one really had talked about insurance or insuring the downside. And uh, that's what led to the Black Scholes uh, option pricing and a lot of insurance, risk transfer, state prices and the like. When Aero Debru initially came out with their state price model, which said if there is a price of risk in each state of nature and each time period, we could take these prices, multiply by possible rewards in each of those states, and then add them up to discount that back to find the present value. But that was really not operational. When Fisher Black and I and Merton developed our models. Well, we think what we did side, if you had one state variable, which say is the economy or the stock market as a representation of the economy, you can generate each state price. And as a result of state pricing, you ended up being able to understand what the price of each state was and to be able to use that in, in capital structure, in, in option pricing generally. And uh, so that made it just very, very operational and very valuable uh, because it made it into a making better decision. The Black-Scholes model, the Merton models are not exact representations, but they get us a tremendous way along in understanding how to value options and to price various contingent type claims. Um, the uh, Breeden and Litzenberger obviously expanded dramatically our work and were able to show how to get state prices and to get uh, the price in each state by taking uh, the second der the derivative with regard to the value of the option to regard to the exercise price for various exercise prices to get the, um, get the state prices at those particular times in a risk neutral uh, setting. So if you look at the idea of finance itself, one of the interesting things about options that we look at and so much more research is necessary in it is we think about options as static or fixed in a sense, this is the exercise price maturity, et cetera. But options are really flexibility and it's really the core of option theory is knowing how we can make things more flexible, how we can reduce constraints, how we can create reversibility, how we can change things in a time sequence so that once we value an option with a constraint or with a constraint that is not binding, then we can figure out how to become more flexible, how we can do things faster, how we can make things more individualized or solutions focused. And these are really the, the core of what option theory and research is going to lead to in the future is what can we do with understanding what the value of an option is with a constraint and how the value of the option can be changed or reduced if we can reduce or mitigate the constraint to some change, some effect. So we want to really think about the idea is Everything in finance, all innovation in society is can we make things faster, more individualized, or more flexible under uncertainty, more optionality, 
at the same or lower cost. And this is where the power of our research and options in the future will be so much more dynamic and so valuable for society. So the key really is more data and with information sets that are large and changing, really the idea in economics is not to concentrate just on the leg of the elephant, but to understand that the elephant is much bigger than the leg. Many people do research and gather data just looking at the foot of the elephant without realizing if you look more broadly, you see a lot more uncertainty, a lot more change, a lot more dynamics that could result. So the constraints are dominate in a lot of ways and eliminating the constraints changes the value of the option because what we want to do is if we know some for certain, and know how to produce things for certain, that's a hardware solution. That's not an option, that's the lowest cost option. We just produce it and that's the efficient idea. But as we end up with more uncertainty, we move away from the hardware, the hardwired solution, the irreversible solution to a software solution. And then from a software solution, we tend to get more flexibility. And when the problem gets so large because shocks occur and the like, we then create more of an idea. The optionality is so large, we just think about the problem and how to redefine it to move forward. So we go from a hardware to a software to a mushware solution and back and forth going forward. So you know, this is really an important thing to realize. We reduce the cost of the options, we change the distribution, we reduce the uncertainty, and we think about what mostly is important is really the tail risks of the distribution of returns. So the functions in finance are really the same in all societies, but how they're provided really differs historically because of different infrastructures, different constraints. These constraints are very important to understand because if you understand the cost of an option with fixed constraints, you then can understand how to mitigate the constraints and what it'll do to the cost of the options that you have. So institutions are subject to competitive destruction, but really governments and government structures try to regulate institutions and not the functions. And so this creates constraints in the system. So governments really try to make things slow in, in, in routinized and inflexible. And so there's always the friction between the two. Uh, the innovator and the regulator are always at cross purposes. So we know that innovation in everything we do has to lead infrastructure. With uncertainty, the innovators are always ahead of the support that occurs. And so the investment banks move, for example, in the Black Shoals Merton world, the investment banks in the early days of our existence, when we developed the model, didn't have any quant departments, didn't have anyone that was doing anything in a systematic, organized way, using data and modeling. What the investment banks were really were uh, principals. They were agents, or they were marrying together buyers of securities and sellers of securities, but were not working as a principal with the technology developed by the Black Scholes Merton technology and the advent of quantitative uh, persons coming into the business, they moved away from the agency business to be a principal model. What did the client want? What did the client need? And can we provide that by using uh, futures, using options, using other instruments to replicate to what to uh, pro give the client what they needed, and then to hedge the risk by replicating that on our own account and taking some uh, risks onto our own account if we couldn't uh, actually uh, transfer them to the market. This led to the whole development of the options market, to the private markets, of the, um, the futures markets in the use. And so it's really this idea to make things flexible and faster for clients and, uh, and uh, more individualized, which really set the whole process of how the world changed from the world that uh, uh, Black, Scholes, and Merton found in 1970s, which became a far different world by the 90s, et cetera, and will continue to be great moving forward as constraints are understood, they're mitigated, and new innovation occurs to reduce the cost of the options. So you have the areas I think about are decarbonation, AI, cybersecurity, blockchain, remote work, all those are, are 
fix because you look at remote work question people are saying should we go back to work or should we stay remotely but the point is they uh you know basically with a software solution you know that if the cost of remote work are higher that software and will be developed that will enable more remote work and more consistently to, through ai to work together remotely or in the office and when we really need to be together in a option framework is when the uncertainty is so large that talking to each other adds a lot of value. So culture, whatever, is talking to each other and how do we figure out a way in a mushware world where we don't understand things to be able to do that. So research and development. We always talk about research and development, but it's really research and testing because you learn so much more from testing. It's trying to understand how to reduce the, uh, increase the dimensionality of the problem. The same thing is true in development. Development is really uncertain. And over time, the development reduces the uncertainty by creating the dimension and reduces the optionality or the cost of the option embedded in the development side. So we have the idea of insourcing now. The United States is great currently in research, but the development part is where the manufacturing is, and that's in China and other countries that are developing things. They have the research, the testing part, and they have so many papers and understanding of how to reduce the option costs, the constraints that exist by changing the option prices. And this is a huge area of thinking about how option theory can be used in that way. So as I said, uh, information in option prices is underutilized in my view, because in so much of finance is fixed. You know, you have, uh, you have uh, performance really relative to a benchmark. And really it's not the idea of what we should think about in finance is not how we do relative to others, but it's how we can do when we think about a compound return. And that should be our major focus. And when we think about compound return, which I'll get to more detail in a second, it's really thinking about it, the idea of what is important in compound return. And it's really mitigation of tail losses, the big losses that are very hard to recover from and missing the big gains that are hard to gain when we lost them. And it's each period of time. And the option markets are provide very valuable information about each period's gains and losses. In compound return, we know it's multiplicative and in multiplication, every period is important. And so what we want to think about is can the option market provide information? Because in making money, you now have to know to make money, you have to be able to forecast the future. That's the so-called alphas. And that is very tough to do. It's forecasting the future because you're competing against a lot of others. And the second way to make money, as I've talked about, is mitigating the constraints, reducing the cost of irreversibility, and be able to create reward, which I've called omega in the past. That's the cost of the constraints. And then the third way is to reduce volatility drag, the beta risk, to make the ride boring going forward and figuring out information to get information from the cross section that makes our ride smoother. So time is a big focus of mine. We only have one run of time. You know, and the idea of one run of time, it's not reversible. And so in uncertainty, when the elephant is very large and unknown, how do we think about moving forward, okay, and reducing uh, the cost of time? And risk management is always the, everything we have done in finance is really two one period or two one period models as opposed to time, which is a multi-period framework where What's important in risks is really the tail risks of the distribution, as I said, and that basically when we think about reserves, we think about a cushion, but how do we use the cushion? When do we think about stocks versus bonds or, or stocks versus cash? And how do we know when to reduce our position? How do we know? Do we always keep it static? That's not a reserve then. Basically, just saying it's a risk model or insurance model. So I'll talk about diversification. Is it free or not free? Diversification fails from time to time as tail risks occur. And insurance is dynamic. 
as once you buy a put option to protect your portfolio, if the asset prices go up, then you have no protection. So how do you, what uh, dynamics do you create when you're doing dynamic strategies are all research areas that are crucial that we need so much more new research to be able to understand and handle. If you look at people's views about options and option prices, what we looked at, my group, we looked at could individual stocks predict, predict future volatility using implied volatility versus using historical volatility. And since the most important risks are important in a market which you have very low transaction costs to make adjustments in your portfolio holdings, option prices tend to be very, very uh, informationally efficient over the next month or over the next 60 days, which I have looked at. When you look at using implied volatility from the option market on individual stocks, not on the market itself, because 1,000 stocks are the largest cap stocks that have very liquid options. It turns out that the coefficient is about 0.9 and 0.95 if you don't use realized volatility at all. But the interesting thing is it's highly significant to use the options implied volatility and the realized volatility is completely subsumed by the implied volatility. So people argue that the Black-Scholes model or its implications are not correct in making forecasts. I was very uh, surprised and pleased to find that over this 261-month period, that basically the options tend to explain about 55% of the volatility. Others have done the same thing and looking at how the options have been able to predict the um, predict the uh, stock market, uh, like the S&P 500, and they get about a, a 0.6, uh, uh, 60% R squared as well. But it's all the use of historical volatility is subsumed within the crowdsourced information of an efficient option market. There's two ways to think about the option market. Could we look for inefficiencies by having better pricing models, or we can take the prices as good signals and then use that to dynamically manage our risk. And I tend to move to the idea the market is efficient and that basically the information in the cross section is giving us lots of signals about what the risks ahead happen to be. If you look at things that were really surprising to me, going back to 1996, I looked at the we looked at the idea of having the idea of a 60-40 portfolio on the S&P and the US aggregate bond portfolio over the period 1997 to April 2020, where I stopped doing a run. And it, just looking at that compared to buying 30% uh, down put options, essentially, where you would uh, be able to uh, look at uh, uh, max, to create a maximum one year drawdown or approximately 30%, which is approximately the drawdown that existed in the 60 40 strategy. And it turns out that. I was very surprised, but the returns were approximately the same on a S&P 500 with a put spread strategy versus a 60-40 strategy. So this, despite the massive boom bond market and the negative correlation between, uh, between the returns on bonds and equities, the SPX plus put spread only underperformed by about 28 basis point per year. The implication really going forward is when you have now not necessarily obviously from an economic perspective the negative correlation between bonds and equities then basically the uh, puts versus the s p really show it's efficient so when you think of a 60 40 strategy you can think of that with it. and by the way the put spreads have different uh, obvious uh, convexity than do the 60 40 which is linear but still the returns are approximately the same and the risk the drawdown risks are approximately the same uh, from these two strategies so basically the idea of if you have 60 percent in the equ of equity and 40 percent in bonds and the risk premium on equities is around five percent expected value that's about a two percent per year cost for that uh, reserve. And the same thing is true if you look at rolling put spreads going forward, it's about a 2% cost as well, providing about the same overall returns. So it's not as though options are costly, it's reserves are costly and re options are not or vice versa. So if you look at 
the terminal wealth, we know that basically in the compound return space, volatility basically is a drag on compound returns and the drag is everywhere. So can option prices forecast volatility in the cross section going forward and options forecast skew? And the idea, each period matters in compound return. If you lose 90% next quarter, it's going to take a long time to recover from. If you lose, miss 150% next month or quarter, it's going to take a long time to recover from that. So compound returns are crucial. And if we move away from performance relative to a benchmark and concentrate on compound returns, then we have to ask, the idea, can we enhance compound returns? Malkiel said that really the only free lunch in finance is diversification. That's true, as long as you don't need it. But when the tails occur, we know the correlations become very high between all equities in the United States internationally, and bond returns become very highly correlated with equity, either plus or minus one. And so basically it means that assets somewhat become redundant. So it's really the tails that are important where volatile, where diversification is lost and the option market has information with regard to uh, the, these things. And if you look at basically the idea of time, Time diversification is important as cross-sectional diversification and more so because if you can think about timing the market, timing the market is time diversification. It's not timing. It's risk managing the market by using information, say, in the option prices so that if you are, in, if you are taking a passive strategy, a passive strategy is really active because the passive strategy's risk is changing all the time if the market risk is changing. And because the elephant is gigantic, looking at the leg of the elephant, thinking you're measuring the risk by using historical data is wrong because basically the risks are changing. And as a result of that, you can end up in a situation where you get excess volatility. With excess volatility over your target volatility, it's going to have the same expected return on your portfolio, because, but at the same time, it's going to have less, more drag as your compound return is affected. So the beauty of options, it talks about risk, and risk is something so crucial to compound return. And so you can think about factors that affect terminal wealth, it's really excess volatility affects it. Uh, maximize next period's good volatility to bad volatility. It's sort of information theory versus the Bayesian approach. So each period gives you information about the risk. The Bayesian is looking at trying to figure out what the expectation is or honing in on it. But if the risks are changing, each period is important. And also you want to think about the compound return, and then figuring out how to control uh, the idea that stocks are going to outperform in the long run, but you can have a great shortfall between stocks and bonds. So the long run is could be very costly in the sense of having a higher expected return, but much greater tail losses. So uh, that these are very important. Fama has argued that buy and hold strategies, ignoring the tails, are things to go. But that's true if you think about one period and one long-term strategy, but every period matters. And so optionality has a big effect on one each period's return. Can the investor hold for the future and have this long-run strategy by, by doing nothing and ignoring the changes in risk? No. Most ideas is that we have debt to ourselves and we have to adjust risk. This is a point Samuelson raised in one of his papers in 1972. So basically, understanding time and how it tends to affect our performance will infect us from the option market. If you look at data from the option market, can you do better by using the information content in, in over time? And if you're patient, the interesting thing is that compound returns create convexity. If you can create convexity in your portfolio, you can enhance your compound return. It will show up more over time. Time uh, creates more compounding and more effects. So you have a very conservative portfolios. You have low drawdown. 
moderate components, you have higher drawdown. Aggressive portfolio, you have higher drawdown. But over time, in a fi- using the option price information to adjust your risk, to create a more convex situation, more convex performance, you see the distributions tend to shift to the right. And the option allows you to have better compound returns and lower volatility by using it compared to various strategies. So the option market not only is a better forecaster of volatility, it's a better forecaster or use in a risk management process to enhance compound returns. So the law of large numbers really does not apply to, say, realizing a sustainable future. Again, one run of time. And the importance of of liability settings where you have costs that rise simultaneously with large changes in climate risk or drawdowns occur, then basically the cost goes up dramatically. So we have to think about the option framework, and it's not talking about just the payoff function, a return function, but what are the costs when the returns are negative? Can we marry the two together? The same thing is true with retirement policy, where people are retiring. If they have a suffer a drawdown at the same time as it's the case, they need to increase their consumption, basically they'll never recover. They lose it. So that we need uh, the idea of thinking about risk over time in every period and how options can be used to understand these risks and garner signals to create better risk management strategies and reduce the irreversibility of the problems that we have. So the diagram I like to use in the normal case is you have a friend who can't cross, can't swim and asked to cross the river. So you tell your friend it's only two feet deep on average, and the volatility might be only one fleet foot deep. It says, no, that's not enough information, Myron. What's the depth of the river here? And if it's really 12 feet deep, then basically he's not going to survive. You don't have, we have one run of time. We don't have the law of large numbers. It just doesn't apply. With time, every period matters. And so we have to think about how optionality well, and flexibility enhances our ability to survive multiple periods of time and to move forward. So I looked here just quickly here is option information from the crisis. And if you look at expected tail losses, given the option markets at the time of the 2008 crisis, the option market was forecasting, even though Bernanke and other regulators had said there was no information we had. All our scientists said there was no chance of having a crisis. If you look at the data, the data were just screaming that the crisis was increasing. The tail losses were going up dramatically in the option market and then came down after the bailouts occurred in uh, 2009 or so. And the the downside to upside risk had increased uh, dramatically at the time of the Fannie Mae Freddie nationalization and Lehman collapse. So the markets are full of information about risk. And even though regulators have all their data associated with risk, they don't tend to use the information as readily in making decisions because market prices are so important, but yet, you know, using historical data, using back tests, using macro models are deemed to be more efficient than what the market price says. And the option market gives, because it's a crowdsourced information market where people are putting money at risk is really a valuable source of information about the risks of the road ahead. So I think that basically future research using option theory, just quickly here, in corporate finance areas, investments areas, liquidity is an option, the idea of constraints and trust. How do you garner liquidity and option? You have private equity, venture capital, et cetera, three and a half percent premium, but that's a short an option. And the idea of what happens when you need liquidity and you can't get it. So the idea of thinking about these costs in a dynamic sense is is very important. Monetary policy, the idea that everyone, monetary policy, they want the economy and macro policy all try to dampen risk. But the question is, how much risk do we need? Why demand risk? Because if we dampen risk a lot, we try to control it and it breaks apart. We end up with more tails. The cost of the tails are much greater, as we know from option theory and compound return space than keeping risk steady for a long time and then blows up and costs tremendous amounts of money. Behavioral finance. We have areas, people talk about regret. I want to sell at the max. I want to buy at the min. 
I want to create asymmetry in my returns. All those are can be priced by options. So the options can tell at the price of these things as opposed to just people having these behavioral tendencies. So in corporate, all these areas in, in, in uncertainty and optionality are all future research, which is going to be very important for making investments and, uh, and savings in that and, and risk management so much more important, monetary policy going forward in the future. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions for you, if that's okay. Sure. The first one is, um, once the paper was completed, did you have an inkling of what impact it would ultimately have on the industry? Uh, no. I, you know, one of the interesting things about being a scientist and, uh, you know, uh, Fisher Black, myself, Bob Merton, were in a scientific mode. We want to solve a puzzle. I, you know, how, how do you insure? What's the cost of insurance? How do you value insurance? How do you value these options? And we, I did not have in my mind at that time uh, an inkling to know two things. One, I knew, and Fisher Black and I wrote, and Bob Merton expanded dramatically on the idea of bonds, corporate bonds as an option, risky bonds as an option. So pricing the capital structure of firm. We thought more along the lines of pricing things. How would you price instruments? We didn't think about the idea that once you had the option framework, it would change behavior. As I try to say in the talk here, it would change how things were done in society. You wouldn't take, once you could price things and know what it cost you, you can make adjustments to make things better. So the investment bankers went from just a product focus uh, being an agent to figure out how to make things faster for clients, how to reduce the constraints of satisfying client demands. I didn't see that. I just thought about pricing existing instruments, but later on started thinking about how to use options to get reduced constraints. How do you make things more dynamic? How do you think about how people will change things in society? And that was something that I did not see at the time. Thank you. And um, a question relating to regulation, um, if that's going to slow down innovation, but markets cannot do without regulation, what's your thoughts on where the happy medium is between regulation and markets? Okay, the idea is that that's a very good question. Always there's a friction at the, at the margin. When my kids, my children were very young, I constrained them all the time. I left them with very little flexibility. I have little optionality and I constrain their activities. As I garner trust with them, then basically I allowed them to be freer and freer. And now that they're quite old, I have to trust them 100%. They're completely unconstrained. So constraints or are actually the uh, regulation is constraints and constraints are the other side of trust. How do we garner more trust? And that's uh, an evolution that has to occur. Either we do it through measurements, such as we have better measurement technologies, which allow us to trust and understand what's going on, or we have more information or more ways of figuring out how trust is generated through truth telling, how trust is, is generated through testing and the like. So hopefully with AI and people worry about innovation in the AI world and we don't trust it, so we want to constrain it. Maybe the idea is under this uncertainty is to allow for more optionality, more flexibility, and, and AI will learn to police itself. The same thing is true with cybersecurity. In, uh, infrastructures build over time and dynamic infrastructures that are uh, based on making profits for oneself are, in my view, much better if you can do it than having one shoe fits all regulation. If, unless we can figure out a way through AI or other new technologies to make regulation more dynamic, so to reduce the cost of constraints and now for allow for more innovation and growth in our societies, uh, that is, to me, uh, a great avenue of investment and research and ideas. Are the days of industry changing models now over with the advent of machine learning and artificial intelligence? All right. So basically, we know that finance is volatility time. It's volatility times time. Life is volatility times time because there's no time is one dimension. 
but volatility is another dimension. And when, thing, when volatility increases, time compresses. So as time gets compresses more and more because volatility increases, we end up with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle of economics or finance, where basically if volatility increases so much, time stops. And what that means is we need to, re, with time stopping, because we can't make decisions, AI can't help us because it doesn't have a fixed points anymore. We have to garner new anchors or new fixed points to be able to move forward. And so that is the interesting question, whether AI will give us the fixed points or whether we as individuals will get new fixed points. When is the value of optionality the greatest? When we're missing the fixed points, then we need our mushware. We need thinking to get new fixed points. What are the anchors that are reestablished if the elephant, we look at the elephant, is so huge, we have to redesign whole new things going forward. AI is terrific given the models it has and generating lots of combinations of various things, but yet it has not figured out a way to get new fixed points or new ways to move forward so we can then restart, re-go again, you know, restart time. And if time compresses, so volatility time increases so dramatically that all our models become obsolete and all our models need to be readjusted and reset and new fixed points. Because without fixed points, we can't take derivatives. We can't take derivatives unless we have really a model or fixed points in which we can then move forward in time. Fantastic. And this one last question, um, just to relating to two previous questions, actually. Um, if an individual or company uses bad data to train a model um, related, resulting in bias um, and um, how integrated market regulations might be, who should be held responsible for an AI based bad decision in portfolio management? Well, I mean, basically, the trust is lost. So, you know, if the client will leave and you're at managing up for money for others, you have constraints, unfortunately, because your trust has to be preserved. And if you make bad decisions based on not uh, bringing things forward, it's going to actually reduce the value of um, what you're providing, and then clients will leave you. But the idea, I think that that's the self policing that'll occur. And I also also think that policing will occur is that you know market prices are pretty profound and are pretty efficient because you have crowdsourced information that's so valuable to use and it'll it will uh, game against and do things differently from what AI would do on its own. So the combination of both are probably more efficient garnering data than alone. But you can't use AI alone, or else it's possibility that you'll end up in a tail situation where you won't have ability to play the game going forward. Fantastic. Thank you um, very much for the additional time spent answering some of these questions. And thank you once again um, for being our keynote speaker today. Oh, thank you very much. And sorry I'm not there in person, but and I guess we're no longer anywhere in person. So it's good. <laughs> Speak to you soon.